Assalamu alaikum, brothers and sisters. Peace be upon you. Hello, non-Muslims. I'm glad you're here. And NOI members are welcome to join. Uh, everyone gather around. And I'm going to speak on something that has perplexed me for quite some time. And that is the basic ideology of what is called the Nation of Islam. The Nation of Islam is arguably politics mixed with Islam and Christianity. And more or less, it came around the times when uh, so-called blacks in America were oppressed. I say so-called because I do not believe in the idea of race. I believe it is a social construct, and the sooner we get rid of it, the better. After all, the apostle of Allah said that the only thing that separates people is not race, but righteousness and uh, how much they follow Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we are going to watch a video that is quote-unquote proof of Fard Muhammad, the, mm, the mentor of Elijah Muhammad, who essentially started the Nation of Islam, which I will also be calling the NOI, and why Fard Muhammad is God. And I've listened to many lessons and lectures, honestly, from Minister Farrakhan, and I can never, ever make what he says jive with a lot of Orthodox Islam. And here we have the problem of what we call shirk, which is essentially ascribing a partner to God. And we believe that Christians do this when they say Jesus is God or a part of God. Whether you say a man is God or part of God, you are basically breaking the oneness, the tawhid, of Allah. And that's not good in Orthodox Islam. I'm not here to step on anybody's toes. I'm here to attempt to guide people to the sunnah, to the way that Muhammad, that Islam originally was, to the orthodoxy of Islam. And I'm also going to essentially comment on what the minister says. So, here we go. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as -salam. Brothers and sisters, if you don't mind, um, we would like to begin the meeting tonight with prayer. So would you please stand? And with your hands outstretched in this manner, head slightly bowed, would you follow me silently in our opening prayer? In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, all praise is due to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, the Beneficent, the Merciful, Master of the Day of Judgment in which we now live. Thee alone do we serve, and to Thee alone do we beseech for help. Guide us on the right path, the path of those upon whom Thou hast bestowed favors, not of those upon whom Thine wrath is brought down, nor of those who go astray after they have heard Thy teachings. Say He, Allah is one. Allah is He of whom nothing is independent, but upon whom we all depend. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is none like him. I bear witness that nothing deserves to be served or worshipped beside Allah, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. And I bear witness that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is thy true servant and thy last apostle. Amen. <coughs> you may be seated. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. Those prayers that you've heard, um, at least English-speaking Orthodox Muslims will recognize them for what they are. One is Al-Fatiha, the other is um, one of the Kuls. Oh, it's embarrassing that I can't remember it. I can recite it for you. Kulu wa lahu ahad Allah samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakun lahu kufu wan ahad, which means... Uh, oh, it's al-Ikhlas. It means, um, essentially, say 
it is God, the one and only true God, the God Almighty. He begets not, nor is he begotten, and there is nothing that stands in comparison to Allah or God. I and Minister Farrakhan will use Allah to mean the English word God. Allah isn't a specific version of God, contrary to what the West believes. Be that as it may, he's mixed up essentially two parts of the Quran together and made them a prayer. I guess that's close enough for jazz. But the biggest issue that I have is that he just said God does not beget nor is God begotten. And yet they believe that Allah, quote, came in the person of Fard Muhammad, who I'm pretty sure was begotten. In the name of Allah, the Beneficent, the Merciful, the one God to whom all praise is due, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, to whom praise is due forever. We thank Allah for blessing us, our beloved leader, teacher, and guide, the Messenger of Allah, the Most Honorable Elijah Muhammad. First, I, I want to say that I'm very happy and honored to see each of you who are here again to your class. We just returned from the West Coast and Phoenix, Arizona. Allah blessed us on the West Coast. There were about uh, 3,500 black brothers and sisters in attendance in Oakland, California. And uh, I wanted to just briefly say that the last time I was in Oakland, I had a long talk with uh, Huey Newton, the uh, leader of the uh, Black Panther Party. The long-awaited decision in the Huey Newton murder trial, which has drawn worldwide attention, is now very near. The jury of seven women and five men are deliberating the fate of the Black Panther leader on the eighth floor of that building. It is their job to decide whether he is guilty of killing Oakland policeman John Fry and wounding Officer Herbert Haynes in a pre-dawn shootout last October 28th. Two floors above the jury in his cell, Huey Newton, who has made almost no show of emotion during the eight weeks of trial, calmly awaits the decision of the jury. For those of you that don't know, and I'm willing to bet it's a lot of you, um, Huey P. Newton essentially was the founder of the Black Panther Party. And the Black Panther Party of the 60s and the 70s is nothing like the so-called black movements of today, but um, it did a lot of good. They opened up a lot of uh, help centers for inner cities, and they weren't, I mean, yes, they were revolutionaries, they were Marxists, but they practiced Marxism on their own, they did it well, and to my knowledge, they weren't necessarily a bad organization. However, that being said, Huey P. Newton himself uh, has been convicted of several crimes, specifically violent crimes, um, and not so much against, quote-unquote, the man, if you will. So I encourage you to look him up, and from an Islamic perspective, that doesn't make me respect Minister Farrakhan anymore, although I do still respect him. It doesn't make me respect him more because he hangs out with some violent person who just happened to also found a nonviolent way to help so-called black people. Doesn't impress me. Sorry. Huey is doing well and is trying to reconstruct the uh, Panther Party. This time, uh, Angela Davis spoke and uh, Eldridge Cleaver and others, and uh, we had a, about an hour conversation with Eldridge Cleaver. And what we see happening across the country is that there is a coming together of those minds that yesterday were at odds with each other. 
So it seems as though the 60s has taught us much and we are trying to implement the lessons of the 60s. One of the most impressive uh, sites of my uh, visit to Oakland was that our minister on the West Coast, Minister Dr. Abdul Malik Rashidin, brought up from Los Angeles, California, a group of black brothers, young men, who were derelicts, young men who slept in the park in Los Angeles, the weather there is nice pretty much the year round. Some of the brothers just hadn't taken a bath in a long, long time. And there was one particular young man that the minister told me you could almost smell him a block away because he hadn't been bathing. But Dr. Rashidin went out in the park and stayed with those brothers and began to teach them. And then I looked up and saw these brothers in Oakland clean, shining, dressed up in a suit and white shirt and a tie. And the tears came to my eyes because I could see even more clearly that though the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was absent, his message still had the same power to reach down in the mud and pick the brothers and sisters up and stand them up again. As a former drug addict, I can tell you that it's not just religion that helps you. Um, religion helped me stop being an alcoholic to a degree, but it was also my own will. It was also me wanting to change. So I would think already, if people are interested in religion they're, or changing religions, they're probably also interested in change and uh, changing their lifestyle and things like that. And I would say myself being a few religions and finally settled on Islam maybe about 13 years ago, that's pretty much what happened. I had dark spots of my life and I, you know, got into Satanism then and I changed what I was doing. I was a libertine, etc. So I think we're not making that particular correlation with this example. It isn't just the word of, you know, Elijah Muhammad, or in my case, it isn't just the Holy Quran that helped me get away from alcohol. It was also myself. It was um, my support system, you know. So it's a lot more complicated than what's being made here. Now, the next issue is that I want you all to know I'm doing this in its entirety because I've been on the Internet far too long to not do that. I want everybody to hear it. It's worth hearing. And for me, I enjoy listening to it in its entirety because the history of, of religion fascinates me, especially the history of the Moorish Science Temple, the history of the Nation of Islam. And I'm sure at some point I'll even roll up, speaking of the Black Panthers, I'll even roll up some Khalid Muhammad footage. So stay tuned and let's continue listening to Minister Farrakhan. So I wanted to start tonight's class by reciting something from, I believe it's the 81st chapter of the Qur'an. I don't have my Qur'an with me, but that chapter is called Al-Abasa. Please listen, fellow Muslims. Let's not try to say because he can't remember something about the Qur'an that he's not knowledgeable about it or anything like this because it's, it, it's not fair and I refuse to attack him in that way. And I ask all who are watching this to please just consider that he is a human being. He makes mistakes. 
which means he frowned. And it talks about Prophet Muhammad, the son of Abdullah in Arabia, talking to a very prominent rich man. And a blind man came tapping up to Prophet Muhammad. And Prophet Muhammad was bothered by this blind man because he was into this conversation with this rich man. And he looked at the blind man and he frowned and turned away. And when Muhammad frowned at the blind man and turned away from the blind man, Allah frowned on the prophet. And this verse was revealed. And Allah says to Prophet Muhammad in that verse, you know, why would you spend your time with those who really have no need of you when a man came seeking you who would be benefited by what you have to say and you turned away from him and you frowned. Now this is the Quran. The Bible has something similar. Okay, so I'd say he's close enough for jazz on that one. He missed a few details and kind of embellished the story to work for, um, typically I would say his arguments, but I, would, I guess I should say to work for the theology of the nation of Islam. So in the actual story, it's not just a blind man. The blind man is incidentally also already a Muslim. And this is just my opinion, but it makes sense to me that Muhammad وسلم, would also focus on leadership because it would make it easier um, for your religion, right? If you're this new religion in a new place, or in an old place rather, um, you got to get some converts so that way basically you're not marginalized, even though that's what happened anyway. And I think that part of that, of course, it was to spread the, mes the message of Allah, of course, first and foremost. But also it would have helped existing Muslims then because there would have been people in power of their religion. And I assume that the hope was they wouldn't be persecuted, and yet they were. So let's hear uh, what the Bible says, which is supposedly a very similar thing. The Bible says it like this. Jesus had a feast and he sent out for the doctor and the doctor was busy. He sent out for the lawyer and the businessman and they both were busy. So he told his disciples, Go out into the highways, into the byways, and bring me the lame, the halt, the blind, the leper. They will fill up my feast. And they did. What is the moral or the lesson? Dear brothers and sisters, the nation started and was built by the most abject of our people. Yes, the people that nobody else wanted could come to Muhammad. He never would turn them down. The people that had no home, no place to go, no one to love them, no one to care about them. Yes, the prostitute, the pimp, the low life, the dope seller, the dope user, the wine drinker, the man that was so far down in the mud, nothing was looking out but his eyeballs. That's one thing about our boy Lou. He's always got a good line like that. That was I got to admit, that's a good one. But that's the man that knew he needed somebody, knew she needed somebody, so they reached out for Muhammad as Muhammad reached out for them. And they came, and in a matter of moments, they were cleaned up. And then when you looked at them again, you saw them clean, shining, strong, doing things that the learned had not the courage to do. Well, as it was that way in the first building of the nation, so it is in the second nation. This is a lesson 
that we're listening to. And I'm assuming that the idea of the nation, or as we call it in Islam, the Ummah, uh, came up prior. And I don't know enough about the concept, honestly, in the nation of Islam. <laughs> but I'm willing to bet that it has to do with race. And I'm willing to bet that, um, you know, for example, so-called blacks and Latinos are part of the nation um, but white people are not part of the nation. In Orthodox Islam, the nation is very similar to the concept of Israel in Judaism. So yes, there's Israel, the place, now a country, right? Arguably democratic. Um, there was Israel, the kingdom of, you know, uh, there's a lot of different places that were called Israel. I mean, they're all in one region, but the borders moved around, right? Because they were kingdoms. The basic idea of Israel is simply the people of Israel who are all Jews, who are all around the world. So they're all Israel, which is why when you look at the Shmas, for example, you have Shema Yisrael, Hashem Eloheinu, Hashem Ehad. Uh, that means, uh, say, O Israel, and they don't mean like just the people in the country of Israel. They mean the children of Israel, the children of Jews, right? So really that's saying, hey, Jews, say uh, the Lord is your God and your God is one, right? So it's the same idea with Islam. We have the Ummah, and the Ummah is basically all of the Muslims of the world, essentially. And yeah, it's something that unfortunately hasn't really come to fruition with either religion, in my opinion. Mostly because we all disagree on things. The people that are going to be the foundational stones of this rebuilding, oh, the doctor may come, the lawyer may come, the teacher may come. And what a blessing it is that such brothers and sisters come at the ground floor level. But the brother and sister who is willing to make the sacrifice even of life is the brother and sister who feel that they don't have nothing to lose. So I'm saying to the brothers of the FOI, to the sisters of the MGT, and to those of you who visit with us, if you know that we are having a general meeting, go get the brother in the mud. Go get the sister in the mud. I mean, if your friend happens to be a teacher or doctor, we don't reject anyone. But the brother and sister in the mud, that's the one. So I have to add a little caveat to what the minister just said. In terms of who they, uh, I guess I could say, allow or those who are welcome to convert to being someone in the nation of Islam, basically they are typically not white. Now, I actually knew someone who was white and who was a member of the nation of Islam. However, he was an exception and not a rule. And I'm sure it probably had to do with that specific, uh, believe they call them temples or mosques. I don't know. I think it's just called a temple and then a number, at least it used to be. But I'm willing to bet that it's basically someone at a local level was like, okay, we'll take this guy, you know. But it is very odd that um, that would ever happen to, to my mind, and I'm sure it's a rare occurrence. So, there are caveats in terms of who can join. It's not like Orthodox Islam, where after all, uh, the Prophet himself, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said that the only way people are different, like there's uh, an Arab is not superior to a non-Arab, nor is the non-Arab superior to the Arab. Rather, it is righteousness that basically separates people, not eye color or skin color. It is how much they follow God, how good they are to other people. So we already have a clear departure on the part of Nation of Islam 
from just Suna. That nine out of ten times will stand up when there's nothing there to stand on but the word. Others who are used to going in and out of fine buildings, they can't join you unless you have a fine building. Oh, I would come, but uh, there, that place, among those people, I can't come. Oh, no. But when you move up on Broadway, I shall be there. Oh, we understand. But there are some brothers and sisters that don't care where truth is. They'll go there. So I thought we would start on that note to let the brothers and sisters who feel that nobody cares, nobody loves you, nobody respects you. I want you to know how the Honorable Elijah Muhammad looks at you. And he said, and I quote, when they said to him, Muhammad, where's your God? He said, every time I look at a black man, I'm looking at God. And I don't take those words lightly. When I look at you, when I look at you, brother, I know who I'm looking at. There's no sense in me praying to God and then mistreating you. Because if I mistreat you, I'm already a mistreater of God. For the very essence of the nature of God is in you and in you. And if you doubt it, if you study that Holy Quran, the Holy Quran is an index of the nature of God. It's telling you what the nature of God is. And really, it's a key to the nature of yourself. And if you doubt that you are like the Quran describes you, brother and sister, let anybody come to you pompous and proud. And immediately you start closing off and rejecting them. Because the Quran says none comes to Allah except he comes as a servant. And none can come to you and win your love and your respect except he comes to you as a servant. Just to give you a recap, we just went from Allah is one to man being Allah. And now we're talking about essentially followers being godly and it has a little bit of precedence i believe uh in one of the books of the tanakh i believe there's a part where it, it, it may even be in the old testament <clears throat> but there's a part where um rabbinical judges are said to be gods with a lower g right in the sense that not only are they the guardians of what was the one true faith, but they also essentially exercise a lot of power. And in that sense, they were godlike. And that is basically um, a little bit of a stretch, I'd say, of an orthodox interpretation of such a thing. You know, we would never say in orthodox Judaism really in any Judaism, except maybe secular, which to me, no offense, but isn't, uh, it, it isn't, well, we all know it's not halakhic, let's put it that way. <laughs> um, Orthodox Jews would basically put a big caveat on that and say, but look, there's only one God, he doesn't have partners, so really we should be calling those people not necessarily gods, but like judges. They can't come to you boastful and arrogant and proud. The Quran teaches us that Allah hates any self-conceited boaster. And you know what? You do too. You may not know why people turn you off, but if they boast, if they're self-conceited, if they're arrogantly proud, it turns you off. But you love the humble. Yes, you do. And there's something about you that whether you are right yourself, you respect righteousness. You hate hypocrisy. You hate anybody. It's in you that preaches a good word and then lives totally contrary to what he preaches. You can't go for that. 
There's nothing in you to make you go for that. You are actually the reflection of Allah. And when you submit, and we submit our will to do the will of God, and when leadership represents Allah properly, they get the good will of the people. And the good will of the people is the very essence of the people. And that's what Elijah Muhammad attracted from his followers. Never has there been a black man in the history of America who was able to get another black man or woman to give him all that we had. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad got it all. That's the truth, brother. He didn't play no games, but we believed in him as the messenger of Allah and we submitted to him and whatever he wanted for us, we gave it to him. And when white folks saw black men and women submitting to black leadership in that way, it totally threw them because they understand that when black men submit to black men, the end of their power over us has come. So anytime a black man rises up with good in him for us, they always try to come in between us and that leader by saying ugly things about that leadership so that you will never give your all to one from among your own kind. See, Whitey knows how to short circuit your respect and commitment. When Malcolm X left the Nation of Islam, and he was like the poster child for the Nation of Islam, part of the reason why he left was because there were rumors that Elijah Muhammad, who was the founder of the Nation of, or I'm sorry, who was the second in, uh, successor in the Nation of Islam, so essentially the second caliph, if you would, um, he was taught by Fard Muhammad, who was the founder of the Nation of Islam. Anyway, this man allegedly had secret children with his secretaries, and some of them were young and he was old, which wouldn't really be that much of a problem in Islam. Uh, the real problem is that none of them were married, and I believe probably even the NOI believes that that is adultery and if that happens with someone that you consider a prophet that yeah that that ain't good son so here he's trying to deflect that her name's eva marie and she's two years old by the minister i didn't do anything wrong i didn't do anything to be put in isolation i believed in him this is saudi She's two. You have Leisha. She's three. From their own mouths, I heard their stories of who had Her fathered their children. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the father of And from their own mouths, I heard that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had told them I was the best. He'll say, yeah, they stealing from you. That will short circuit your respect and your commitment just so. They jive in you. See? When they start talking like this, you pull back. And the moment you pull back and you close up your support, then the enemy says we're on the road to overcoming them. So I just thought we would start our meeting with that as a base. I would love that you love our people and love the worst of our people. I'm talking about the brother that's so messed up when you see him you just feel that you should hurry by him. That's the brother you should stop and talk to. I met one in the barber shop the other day. He's a young man, but he's a derelict. And I'm going after that young man because I know if we can scoop him up out of the mud, he'll be a strong soldier once his mind is turned on right. And that's what every FOI... I want us to go like we did when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was here. Go after the little man in the mud. The intellectuals of our people, they're going to come when they see masses coming 
they can't help themselves. They'll come too. And remember last week we talked about the colt and the donkey. The colt is in here tonight and the donkey is too. Meaning the young intellectuals and the young unlearned will walk together to build a nation for ourselves. To build a nation for ourselves. At this point, I feel obligated to mention that there's some dog whistling going on here. When he says our people, he means so-called black people and the so-called black people of the NOI. And it's no different than if you were listening to Richard Butler talk about Christian identity, which is a white racist ideology in which um, basically they believe that whites are the best and that black people are here to taunt them essentially as devils. And that is the most ironic thing about all of this, is essentially both of the so-called races in both of these seemingly polar opposite groups really stand for the same thing, ignorance and racism. Now, program and position from Message to the Black Men. You have your books? It's on page 161. Yes, sir? Certainly, certainly. One is, uh, and I don't know if this is a question, but a statement that I don't clearly understand this particular point. And uh, what I don't understand is the statement. Now, we went from uh, very beginning to who is God and Allah and uh, we dealt with the devil and Yahoo and so on. And we learned. Uh, which is totally contrary to Christian theology, that Allah is a man, and that Allah is the father of the original man, and that Allah came in the personage of Master Farad Muhammad, who was a man, and I'm assuming was born of a woman, just like every other man. Uh, I think I also heard that Master Farad Muhammad uh, was a, a white man, or his complexion was such that he would appear to be a white man, and that he revealed himself as God to the messenger Elijah Muhammad. And our knowledge of the law and Master Farad Muhammad came through the messenger. What's <coughs> What I don't understand is that this whole thing of law is a man, law ain't a man. And the other thing is that I'm just a bit, and I guess one of the things that was a problem for me in accepting Christian theology that turned me off from the church and even made me just a bit angry with God himself, if I might be very honest. I said, who is this God who knows that I am a person seeking clearly understand who he is and how he exists, yet he does not reveal himself to me. And I'm feeling that way, you know, right now. Here I'm getting some teachings here from the messenger, totally different from all that I've been taught all of my life. And brother, it's just as hard for me to grab this as the other world. <coughs> and I need, uh, if you would, just to, you know, help me with that. Just a bit. Okay. Now we're going to get essentially the typical, oh, look over here argument from the nation of Islam. Nothing is ever really directly addressed, and I wouldn't put it past them that this person is a plant, meaning that they put him in the audience to ask such questions. But when you continue to listen they're really not answered. And some of them are very basic, like why does suffering exist if there is a God, right? Now, first of all, I want to say that 
There is a, an old saying that truth is stranger than fiction. Some of our people would rather believe that a spirit created the heavens and the earth rather than to believe that man is capable of doing this that has been ascribed or given to a spirit or non-entity. Now there are many things that has, have been said in the statement that you made that we could take the whole night on. And what I would like to do is pick up on it and give you germs of thought on it and then deal with it in a total subject. Because if we have misunderstood God all these years, we can't say we're going to understand God in a day. To me, that last line is relatively sufficient, but at the same time, that is why in Islam we have scholars and such. And yeah, I learn stuff slowly. I study fiqh law. I've studied the Quran. I've studied the Hadith, you know, the whole nine yards. And yeah, it didn't come instantly. But here's the thing is the explanation of God is consistent in Orthodox Islam. In the nation of Islam, it is not consistent at all. But the key to understanding the reality of the divine being is understanding the reality of yourself. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, in telling us that Allah, God, is a man, that puts him on the outside of the whole Islamic world. Because the whole Islamic world believes that God is a spirit. Right. Now let's put this up on the board. Or they say God is a supreme force. Right? But there is no force that we know of in the universe that doesn't have behind it intelligence. Electricity is a force, but it's not intelligent. So we just can't say that the, that the universe was created by a force and leave it like that because there's too much intelligence in the design and order of the universe to Say that it was just a force that created it, but forces don't have intelligence. So it must be something that is force, all right, but a force that is governed and guided by intelligence. So sure, some may call it intelligent design or something. But yeah, I mean, I think that this is still a decent explanation in terms of a supreme being, that they are the force that guides those forces that creates life and the universe, etc. And by they, of course, I mean Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. All right, so we got intelligence here. Now, look, brother, sisters, the prophets say they heard God speaking to them in their ear. What force do you know of that speaks? Come on. Do you know any force, name any force that you study in physics, chemistry, any force in the universe that com communicates words in a language in the ear of men? Please listen to the wording that he says when he asks that rhetorical question about what have you studied in science? What, you know, he's asking about 
materialistic things. So, of course, he's forcing you to answer no because of the, shall I say, academic, um, objective measuring stick that he's using. Whereas, if we take that out, I can say, and Islam will say, well, angels can do that. Can you name one? No, you can't. So if the prophet said they heard God's voice, what force has a voice? A voice speaking words in a language that the prophets understood. God didn't present himself to all of the prophets, but he communicated with them through what they call dreams, <coughs> visions, and they heard his voice. But only one prophet in the scripture says he saw God face to face. And God spoke to him out of his mouth. That's Moses. Right, right, right. Abraham did say he saw. Right. Exposed one, didn't he? Uh, yes. But three. Yes. <laughs> now. The standard thing a Muslim would say about this, an Orthodox Muslim, and I would believe even the unorthodox Muslims like Wahhabists and ISIS and such, um, even they would probably say, but here's the thing, the Bible and the Torah and all previous scriptures have been corrupted by man and easily interpretable in multiple ways versus the Holy Quran and its revelation and how we have scholarly works and hadith and all that jazz to keep it orthodox and to show people who are not practicing orthodoxy, orthodoxy. If we want to understand the reality of God, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that we live in a material universe. And God would have no pleasure in creating a material universe if he himself were nothing of matter. That's right. That's right. Everything that he created, you see. And there are things that he created that you don't see, but nothing that he created is outside of matter. Spirit and energy is wrapped up in matter. Even down to the very most intense light. They say it's a wave, but that wave is also matter and energy. Oh, right. <laughs> Even when they put an X-ray, which is a which is a, a we would say a lower form of light than laser. But the x-ray passes through you. But the x-ray still is matter. Now, if this is so, then if Master Farad Muhammad was born of a woman, how could he be God? But the Christians teach that Jesus was born of a woman. Yes, they do. And they say that Jesus lived like ordinary men and then grew to become God and all in heavens, uh, all the powers in the heavens and earth were turned over to Jesus so that Jesus became the Christ, which means true God, true man. So obviously a lot of that is complete nonsense because in Orthodox Christianity, um, 
Jesus, alayhi salam, was the Messiah from birth. He didn't grow into Messiahship. Um, he's not Luke Skywalker. I've also heard that Christ means anointed, and essentially the idea being that since he is the Messiah, and according to Christians, God on earth, which is a major problem in Judaism and Islam, this essentially means anointed by God. That's Christian teaching. But when you tell the Christian that God is a man, he don't want to hear it, but yet Jesus was a man. Let me tell you, Lou, it gets a lot more complicated than that. The first Jews who followed Jesus, probably since they were Jews, and not probably, definitely did not believe that he was part of a trinity, part of God, or God, or however you want to put it. The first Jews said what I had said before, Shema Yisrael Hashem Eloheinu Hashem Ehad, meaning that, say, O Israel, the Lord is your God, and your God is one. There is a Sephardic Jewish philosopher. I believe his name is Maimonides, and he was Spanish, um, and he had set down 13 principles. One of them is about the oneness of God in Judaism, and he says explicitly that God is one, not one of a series, doesn't have a partner, the whole nine yards, and that embodies the monotheism of Judaism. And I'm sure they have a name for it, which I don't know. In Islam, we call it Tawheed. And you, if you believe that someone is a part of God, a son of God, is God, you know, as a man, then basically you're breaking Tawheed and you are committing what we call shark. Before and after his resurrection, Jesus was man. All right? Now... The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, the brain of man is infinite. The brain of man is infinite. Whatever you can conceive in your mind, you actually have the ability to bring it into reality if you can conceive it. Now, if the brain of man is unlimited and whatever he can perceive and conceive, he has the ability to bring it into reality. And you have to admit that we are living under an inferior, uh, we say, mind. We're not living when man is at his best. You are looking at man at his worst. Look at this now. You are nowhere near what you are by nature. You have not a atom's weight of your potential. The white man who is a Johnny come lately. Now listen to this, brother. If you believe that the white man is a new man on our planet. And we studied that in the teachings of Alam Elijah Muhammad on the making of the white man. He's a new man. His own scholars and scientists bear witness that he's new. His own geneticists, biologists bear witness that white people cannot produce black. But they also bear witness that black is the foundation upon which all human beings uh, have come into existence. If that is true, then how could the white man rule except you slept? Since two things can't occupy the same space at the same time, God gives you a sign in the night and the day that when day comes, night goes. When night comes, day goes. That is to tell you in one essence that when evil rules, righteousness does not hold sway. But when right and light come back to power, evil, wickedness must vanish. So if the black man is the original man, and we bear witness that he is the original man, and he was in the beginning the first ruler, 
and the builder of civilization, but he's not ruling now and he's not building now. Well, what happened to the wisdom that he used to build superior civilization to the civilization that white folks have put on the planet that we are now living under? Where's the knowledge that he used to embalm the dead to make them last for thousands of years looking the same way they look when they, were di when they died? Where's that knowledge? Where's the knowledge that made them to put paint on the inside of the pyramids and that paint thousands of years later looks just as fresh as the day it was painted. What chemistry did they have? What mathematics did they have? What science did they have to put blocks of stone that weigh 10 and 20 tons, some of it, stack it on top of each other with no mortar in between but air couldn't get through? What knowledge of astronomy did they have to build such magnificent building called the first wonder of this world, which means that the white man wonders how it was done. You understand? Now look. That's right. We're going into some Eric Von Daniken territory. Uh, somebody get ancient astronauts on the phone because Elijah Muhammad taught his followers the vision of the prophet Ezekiel was essentially a UFO. And here is a little bit from the book of Ezekiel. It is 115 to 118. This is the standard Bible English version. Quote, now, as I looked at the living creatures, I saw a wheel on the earth beside the living creatures, one for each of the four of them. As for the appearance of the wheels and their construction, their appearance was like the gleaming of a barrel, and the four had the same likeness, their appearance and construction being as it were a wheel within a wheel. When they went, they went out in any of their four directions without turning as they went. And their rims were tall and awesome, and the rims of all four were full of eyes all around. So this sounds essentially like a prophecy, right? And Louis Farrakhan commented, and I quote, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad told us of a giant mother plane that is made like the universe, spheres within spheres. White people call them unidentified flying objects. Ezekiel, in the Old Testament, saw a wheel that looked like a cloud by day, but a pillar of fire by night. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the wheel was built in the land of Nippon, which is now called Japan, by some of the original scientists the original scientists being black scientists, uh, the worst of which was, of course, Jakob, who created the white race. Um, that's not part of the quote, but I'm filling you in. Uh, these things are made, I'm continuing the quote, these things are made from the toughest steel. America does not yet know the composition of the steel used to make an instrument like it. It is a circular plane, and the Bible says that it never makes turns. Because of its circular nature, it can stop and travel in all directions at speeds of thousands of miles per hour. He said, and this is again Farrakhan quoting Elijah Muhammad, he said there are 1,500 small wheels in this mother wheel, which is a half mile by a half mile. This mother wheel is like a small human built planet each one of these small planes carry three bombs. <laughs> what? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said these planes were used to set up mountains on the earth. Wow, that sounds a lot like Scientology and the dumping of souls. Wow, there's just, this is such an amalgamation. The Quran says it like this. We have raised mountains on earth, lest it convulse with you. How do you raise a mountain? And what is the purpose of a mountain? Have you ever tried to balance a tire? You use weights to keep the tire balanced. That's how the earth is balanced, with mountain ranges. I question that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that 
we have a type of bomb that when it strikes the earth a drill on it is time to go off and yeah so enough enough of this quote right there's there's a lot of just eric von daniken gibberish here and i really want to point that out because in the end that's where all this is going to go if he's such a scholar brother and such a scientist and he does not now have the knowledge of the pyramids and does not have the knowledge of ancient civilizations of our fathers that lie buried under the sands and the jungles of what is called Africa that are being unearthed today to show that the black man had superior civilization before the white man was even a thought in the mind of his father. Where is that knowledge now? And if that knowledge was so high and an inferior man is coming to rule, he's coming to rule with an inferior knowledge. And that inferior knowledge is to put a ceiling on your growth and your development. At this point, I would point out that this is a lot of what we call false dilemmas. We actually know a lot about the building of the pyramids. And we have the main issue is that it's believed this thing called the King's Chamber was actually a ramp with a trolley on it that would lift blocks up and down. And we also know that they used logs to just throw underneath the big stones to pull them and they didn't go very far you know the the quarry site wasn't that far from the pyramids they also had tried other pyramids and failed so as with anything else it was a learning experience aliens need not apply this is why to my dear masonic brethren and shriners which is not disrespectful because we always honor and respect wisdom. And our brothers in the shrine are very, very wise. And when we meet a brother of such caliber of wisdom, we bow in honor of that wisdom. But look, the sign is given to you that the ruffians took the man that had the, the architectural genius, the knowledge of how to build Solomon's temple, and they hit him in the head. And they buried him in a shallow grave. That is to say, he's not dead too deep. He's in a shallow grave, but a sprig of Cassius a little green is coming up out of the grave to show that, yeah, there's still some life in him. But you've got to have the right knowledge to pull him up out of that grave. And when you pull him up in his head is the wisdom to build the superior temple. And it's not talking about a temple of stone. Jesus hinted at it when he said the kingdom of heaven is within you. It's innately a part of your nature. The absolute divine wisdom of the creator sleeps in you. And white folks know this. Now I'm going to say something from the Bible. I didn't mean to get off into this. Oh, brother. But brother LeVon, see, you are such a good student. You just bring the best out of other students by your good questions. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, this world of the white man is styled in the scripture as death. They function all right in it, but you can't. Look, did you read in Message to the Black Man where the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that the white man came in in a vacuum? in our history what is a vacuum come on now you students of physics a vacuum is that which is absent of air of water of life 
Huh? They do experiments today with electricity in a vacuum. I won't go into the technical uh, engineering methods that I have been blessed to, to study which bear witness to the messenger's teaching, but that, that we can get at another time. But the point is, this period of the white rule, we say 6,000 years, is called a vacuum. I think that's spelled right. Is it V-A-C-C-U-U-M? Okay. Is it V-A-C? One C? Thank you. And you gotta help me. <laughs> now, in a vacuum, there's no light. So if this world is called death, who is it death to? Since the white man himself is the ruler in the vacuum, this is his environment. He thrives in the environment of the vacuum, but you can't because there's no atmosphere. And what is the atmosphere in a, uh, uh, that, that, that takes it out of a vacuum state? You must have air and water. And air means inspiration. Water means divine wisdom. And as long as you are deprived of the water of divine life, divine truth, divine wisdom, you die as a serious mind to contend with death or with the white man's work. He kills in you your ability to rise to the heights of God. That's the only way he can rule. Now look, you inhale his environment and it causes you to sleep. Because there's no spiritual life in the white man's environment for you to feed on. He gives you institutions that feed you death. So you die as a mind in the vacuum. Statements like this is why I often say the nation of Islam is a mixture of religion and politics. What we basically just heard is a parable of what was going on when there was heavy st systemic racism in the United States. Just to insert my opinion, I think we still feel the effects of systemic racism, but I don't think it exists any longer. And especially now, minorities are doing a lot better in terms of jobs and such, and women too, in my generation anyway, are actually making more money than the men. They're more educated as well than the men. So things are looking up in my opinion. Anyway, what we just heard, I believe, is essentially a parable about being black at the time of, you know, say the 30s, and how institutions really were putting uh, so-called black people down and denying them certain rights that whites had, essentially, or worse, terrorizing them. There's a lot. So... If we go back to the time of the formation of the Nation of Islam, we can see where this rhetoric came from. And now we have the problem of we had, I mean, I doubt there were very many uh, black judges back then. And now there are many. Um, and same thing with females doing professional work, being judges. I doubt there were many then, but there are actually a decent amount now. So it's important to look at the context in which the NOI existed and use that context to look at their theology and think about why they're saying this stuff. You have never looked in the mirror and actually seen yourself. And that's why you don't have no love for you because you don't know nothing that a black man ever did that's worthy of respect or honor, much less to dare to say that a black man is God. That blows your mind totally out because every black man you've ever seen has been nothing. And even if he does something, your mind has been trained to suspect what he does. So even when he does something of value, you say, that nigga ain't doing nothing. You've heard it said if a black man is selling oil and a white man is selling oil, 
We always think that the white man's oil heats better. If a black man is selling ice and a white man is selling ice, the white man's ice is colder. I mean, we actually think that black folk cannot do anything well. And these indeed were prevailing ideas because the black race was seen as inferior to the white race. And that was pretty much as far as that went. That All right, that's a stage of death. Now, here comes Master Farad Muhammad. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Master Farad Muhammad's father was Allah before him. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that Master Farad Muhammad's father was Allah before him. What does Allah mean? The Quran opens up saying, I, Allah, Noah. Well, the one who is the best Noah is Allah. See? Now look. There's no force. There's no force that you know that says it is the best Noah, though knowledge is the supreme force. Is that right? But knowledge has to be contained in something. Spirits don't walk around talking and, 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 and conveying knowledge. It's a mind that contains knowledge. And man is the supreme life in the universe. And he's formed right after God himself. This is why the Quran says Islam is not your religion. It is your nature. It is the nature of God and the nature in which God created man. No, Lou, the Qur'an said that it was our nature to submit to Allah, not that we are Allah. He gives you his same nature. Well, if you've got his same nature, then you and him is the same. So you're not a child of God. You are God, a descendant of the Creator himself. Now, let's look at this. All right. Now, it's time to get you. The time has come. All these prophets have been talking about God will come. There ain't no prophet that said God is present. They said God will come. Moses kept saying, and when he come. Noah said, and when he come. Lot said, and when he come. And even Jesus said, and when he comes. The spirit of truth. He will guide you into all truth. Jesus wasn't talking about himself. He was talking about somebody that he recognized as greater than himself. And that thing that was greater than Jesus, alayhi salam, was, of course, the Abrahamic God. I'm sure we're hearing this out of context as well, because, quote, and when he comes could mean judgment day, for all we know, in this incredibly limited context. David, the great prophet of Israel, looking down in the wheel of time, saw the master prophet. This is why when you call the Honorable Elijah Muhammad a messenger, that's the cheapest title you could give him. Because he's not just a messenger, he's the master of all prophets. He masters what they taught. They were in darkness. They reveal words of light, but they themselves didn't understand the depth of what God had given them. But the one who comes in the last day don't come as a prophet. He comes with God. Mm, excuse me. Everything white start running, you know, when truth comes. <laughs> All right. Now, brother, we're going to finish this quickly. Master Farad Muhammad, he's not on the scene. But it is written that God would come after the sheep that was lost. God would come after you. Now, he wouldn't send no prophet. He would come himself. The book says, in that day when God comes, this is the Bible, every eye shall see him. Every tongue shall be made to confess. How are you going to see something that you can't see? What do you mean 
And on, in that day, when you see him, you will be like him and he will be like you. What are you talking about? That's in the Bible. See, as long as you don't see God as yourself, you won't call out of yourself your capabilities. But as long as you think that the master of the universe is some spirit out there, you will never see yourself with the capabilities and possibilities of mastering the very forces of the heavens and the earth. So the obvious question to ask here is, if that is true, then how come no member of the NOI has come forward um, and mastered all the pieces of the universe and everything? It's just, it's sheer nonsense. I think basically the exact opposite of this, that Allah is greater than I. Um, I can certainly achieve things on earth, um, but I am no God. No man is God. It is only God who is God. And he does not beget. He is not begotten, right? I have recovered from addiction. I have learned to manage life better as someone who has depression. And part of that is because of my religion. So I'm getting the same results in terms of cleaning up, of changing my life, I'm getting similar results with essentially an opposite viewpoint. So that kind of puts a hole into this entire argument. I but you are the natural master of the forces of the universe. But you're going to have to grow into that now. All right. Now here comes the God talking. It's time to go after the sheep that is lost. Where are they lost? They're lost in the West among wolves. Who lives in the West? The Caucasian. Mm. Well, anything that's jet black, if he come into that house, they'll spot him immediately. So the old Christian said, prepare me a body that I may go down. Brother, this is beautiful wisdom if you understand it. Here's a man coming that's going to judge two people. The white man and the black man. He got to judge them, so he's got to have the nature of both in order to deal with both. So in order to produce one that can get among the devils. Oh, brother, this is something powerful. Now I'm just going to give you the example. In order to produce one that can get among the devils. He's got to find the right earth to plant his seed in. Look, there's all kind of products that a farmer can produce. You just got to know the nature, quality of the earth and the nature and quality of your seed and what you want to produce. Then you find the right earth for your seed. One thing that we have never been taught, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad mentions it in the book on knowledge of self, the white man never wanted to teach black people the science of mating. That's right. We just lay down and have children and luck up on geniuses because we so... I've paused here because I just want to mention that there is essentially a gap in the audio here. So I haven't removed anything. You can check out the original YouTube video. I'll probably toss it in the description. I'm starting to wonder if we're going to get to the aliens seeding the earth theory. It would make sense in the context of the nation of Islam at its height during the 60s and arguably the 70s. And at that time, Eric von Daniken was around along with others. And then later on in the 80s, you get loons like David Icke. And they all tie in basically esoteric ideas to eventual aliens of some kind. Wise men study themselves. Know themselves. They say, well, I know the multiplier. Now let me study what product I want. 
And if I want to produce this product, then if I am the multiplier and I know what I am, then what is the multiplicand? Where will I find what I'm looking for to make my product? For instance, if I know that I am a four and I want to produce an eight, then I've got to find a two to multiply with to produce the eight. This is called the product. This is called the multiplier. This is called the multiplication. Is that right? Yeah. All right. Well, it's the same way in mathematics it, 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 it is in life. If I know what I possess, my characteristics, my qualities, but I know what I need, then I set my sight to look for the woman that has what I'm looking for so that when I multiply with her, I'll get the product that I'm after. The wise father of Master Farad Muhammad was after a product that could get in among the devil. And the scriptures say this of him. They said he came in sinful flesh to condemn sin in the flesh. Oh, this is heavy stuff. Now look, Master Farad Muhammad, yes, a man, born February 26, 1877. He's not the originator of the heavens and the earth. No, he wasn't here then, but he's from that same line. But his knowledge is so great that it supersedes the wisdom even of his father. Now listen to this. And this is where I get confused because we heard in the beginning about there only being one God and how he came in the person of Fard Muhammad, yada, 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 and how there's only one God worthy of praise and all that jazz. And yet we're, we're now saying, at least from what I hear, that... Um, Fard Muhammad was essentially a demigod. And this, again, is really starting to feel like that quote about Jewish scholars and judges that I'd heard, you know, ye are gods thing. But um, with that entire Jewish caveat, we have to remember that basically, if we interpret that the proper way, it doesn't mean that they're actual gods or even demigods. It just means that they're masters of their realm and garters of the faith. So that's why I submit that judges or something like that or wise men um, applies better than gods. And in this recent context, not in context from 20 minutes ago, but in this recent context, it seems more akin to what he's saying. So we're flip-flopping. He was so wise, so says the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, the man pictured and extracted the language of the people on Mars. He spoke the language of the birds. Talked to the wild beasts, man. He knew the language of the human family. I mean, he listened to you think. Know your thoughts. That ain't no heavy thing when you understand. That's minor stuff. But the heaviest thing is to control the, uh, the universe and master its laws and make the universe bow to his will. That's, right. That's the kind of power that he has. Right. Now he comes to North America, as the scriptures say, he came alone. That's right. And the books say he would measure the earth, right. measure it, right. and tell its measurement. And when he came, he shot to us a barrage of questions. What is the square mileage of the earth? How much is the land? How much is the water? He's running it. And we, he gives the answer. 196,940,000 square miles. That's, right. That's the square miles of the earth. The water is 139,685,000 square miles. And the land is 57,255,000 square miles. He started running the circumference, the diameter, and the distance between the planets. He's telling the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, look, man, I'm the master of this. And I'm going to make you the master of this. So I'm going to give you a flag that shows a master. I don't want you to have no little jive stars and stripes. 
I don't want you to have no little jive rag around you. I'm giving you a flag that shows a master. I'm giving you the sun, the moon, and the star. And the only man that's qualified to wear that flag is a master. And you got to master the law that governs the universe in order to be qualified to wear the flag of the universe. But I'm going to give you that because I'm a master and I'm going to make you a master. But before I make you a master, I got to make one man among you a master. Because I'm half original now. I got a white looking face, though my father's a jet black man. But I'm coming to put a black head on a black body because I'm not to be the head of that body. I am to be the head of the head of that body, but I'm not to be the head of that body. Therefore, I search among the lost found to find me one man worthy. And he found a little Georgia-born black man that only went to the third grade of school and he taught him three and one-half years and went away. Right. Now, to prove that he's God, he leaves a man that ain't went to school. Right. And the man confounds the scholars with what his teacher taught him. Right. Look here, now. To prove, look here. <laughs> See? To prove that he's God. He tells little Georgia born Elijah what was on Mars and what is on the moon and the nature of the moon and how the moon got to be the moon. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad revealed it and Whitey go up and bear witness, Elijah right. Here's a little Georgia born man telling you what was coming down the pike. We couldn't even see the pike, much less what was coming. And every word that Elijah spoke is right on it. Who taught him but a master? So that's more or less the answer. They like to say that they believe there's only one God and it's the supreme being, but then we get into this man is God gobbledygook, and it sounds to me like they're saying two things at the same time, or are at least using demigods, which are smaller gods. So like there's Allah, and then there's Fard Muhammad, who came to earth as a god but isn't the original god which to me denotes a demi slash semi god you know and that's not really orthodox islam and it doesn't jive with tawhid or the oneness of allah so lots of problems here now those who say that master farad muhammad is not god then who are you worshiping you say, I worship the true God, Allah. Well, then what has your God taught you that is superior to what that man taught Elijah? Um, that man can't be God, I guess? That's, that's a pretty big one. How come your scholars can't handle the followers of Elijah? How come the world couldn't deal with that man Elijah? How come the white man, who is a vicious beast, brother, God raised up a little lamb in the midst of a beast, and the beast couldn't eat Elijah? Who was the God shutting that man's mouth and opening the mouth of Elijah? We don't carry no guns. We were taught by Master Farad Muhammad through the messenger, don't even cast so much as a pen knife. And they have attacked us, and we've taken their weapons and killed them with their own weapons. What God has been with us? And to prove that God is still with us, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has left, but he left his word with us. Now we take the same word and go right back to what the white man tore down with hypocrites among us. And we are building it back up, defying the world. God is present. And you're going to see it more and more when the devil start attacking in the future. You see that they won't be able to do nothing with Elijah Muhammad nor his followers. No, there's a God. He's present. And he got power. Now he teaches the messenger. And he puts the messenger in power over the devil. The messenger said right over here on 48, 47 South Woodlawn. He wouldn't go to no devil. The governor called him. Mr. Mohammed, we'd like to speak to you. Say, you may come. <laughs> the president called him. Mr. Mohammed, we'd like you to be at our inauguration. 
not me. I don't go to the White House. You come here. God's man. He sat there with architects. Architects telling him that I studied architecture. I'm, I'm an architect. He said, yes, but I'm the messenger of Allah. You do it the way I tell you it should be done. I know what you know not and what you know. The man, I tell you, that man Elijah Muhammad, oh, brother, the greatest black man that ever came among us. And to prove that you are God, Elijah Muhammad was made a God right in the midst of us. Oh, yeah. Oh, brother. And to prove, he's going to prove that you God. He's going to make one out of you in spite of yourself. You just take his teachings and study them and see, will you not make people bow? But when they bow to you, don't you misuse them, because that's your trial. Because any man man will bow to you if you have superior wisdom. Now I conclude this little discourse. Well, we got to get on with our class. (laughs) We certainly are. Look, dear brothers and sisters. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, naturally, as a man, he got to submit to the law of death. The Holy Quran says, you know, Allah don't die. Allah don't die. Allah is also not dependent on food, does not need sleep, is not born, and yes, does not die. So, yeah, where are we going with this? But what does it mean? Since the flesh and the blood is the housing for the spirit, the flesh obeys the law. If he creates you in his nature, he bows to the same law that he created. But what is it that continues? It's the wisdom. Now what is his role? He is to make a nation out of you and me. And this nation that he makes, He's going to put his wisdom and light and knowledge in this nation. And this nation is to rule forever just like that sun out there governs the whole universe. You are to be a spiritual son to the whole entire planet of man. And that's what the ritual of Mecca is all about. People going to Mecca of every race, every color, and every hue making circuits around the black stone. You are the black stone. You are the nation that the stone is referring to. And black, brown, red, yellow, and white are to revolve around you and take nourishment from you even as the planets take nourishment from the sun to bear witness that there is no God but Allah. And he is a man. And he came to bring out a man what is dormant in the black man to make him God again, respected, worthy, and honored. So, of course, we still hear remnants of the conditions of the 20s and the 30s and how the nation of Islam wants to lift the so-called black man up to become godly again, to become kingly again, yada, yada. The Black Stone is an article of contention for some. It's something that's, uh, I want to say, in and on at the same time, but it's on the Kaaba, which is that big cube thing that Muslims circle around during a journey called Hajj. So it's not in the Quran. Really, the Black Stone is significant because... The tribes kept it there, and at one point before the Holy Quran was revealed to Muhammad, basically he was asked to move the stone, so that's why it's coveted. And I critique a lot of stuff like that myself as a revert Muslim, specifically from Christianity. I see certain things that Muslims do as almost deifying Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, especially uh, when they save objects of his and stuff like that. And sure, there's spectacles, and I mean, it's cool that that sword might be 
the sword of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But at the same time, why are we celebrating his birthday? That feels a bit too uncomfortable. You know, it, it's way too close to celebrating Jesus's alayhi salam's alleged birthday on Christmas, right? So there are aspects that I find problematic even in orthodoxy only because I am very anti-iconism. Um, and that's why I'm a Sunni and not a Shia, of course. The idea that the black stone represents the so-called black race is about as good as believing in ideas of Afrocentrism. And it kind of harkens back to that for me. I'm seeing a lot of ideas, not just what I first saw, which was Islam merged with Christianity, but now I'm seeing other ideas like the ancient astronauts theories, the alien stuff. It's, it seems like an amalgamation of a worldview. And of course, religion will shape a worldview, but this thing is so complex, it isn't funny. I think we worthy in the high masonry. And you are to be a worthy and a grand master. You. And you too. Because the messenger says the woman is the second self of God. The second self of man. And you sisters have never known your great value to God and to the nature and power of your man. You have not known yourself. You have a better idea about your power than he has about his. But you're still a long way off, sisters, in the knowledge of yourself. But the honorable Elijah Muhammad, when he gets finished teaching you, and this is just the beginner's course, what do you think you'll be like when the finishing school is put on you? This is the beginning course. Now, you know, dear brother uh, uh, um, Shriner, if in the shrine you get 33 degrees of a circle, that's not even enough to stand you upright. You got to have 90 degrees to make a perpendicular. Right? But that's not nothing but a quarter of the circle. The circle is 360 degrees. Well, where's the rest of that knowledge? When you get that knowledge, you become a master of the universe. And that, my dear brothers, is what we're going to evolve to. Man is God. And every day I look at the white man, I bear witness that man is God. When I see the white man, and he's a Johnny come lately, and I see the marvelous things that this grafted man is doing, he's only a hint to me of what the original man can do when the original man is back to himself, and he does it naturally. So I'm sure there are people out there watching this thinking, well, Randy, you know, if it's empowering people, what does it hurt? I had someone very close to me who didn't believe in Afrocentrism, and I exposed it for what a farce it is. But uh, she had said, essentially, look, I mean, if it helps people, that's great. If it makes them more confident, that's wonderful. And I mean, yeah, that is a wonderful thing, but if you're not telling historical truth, it, it's not helping. If you say all Africans were so-called black and that they were the first civilization and everything, there's no proof for it. And we have a similar thing going on here where they call themselves the nation of Islam and they believe all of this stuff that is completely unorthodox, including these racial ideas. At least Jehovah's Witnesses and people like that, the different, you know, offshoots essentially of Christianity, have the decency to not call themselves Christians. And I really wish the NOI would not call themselves Muslims. That Caucasian is a monster. 
He's right now in the laboratories trying to create life. Yes, sir. But it was a series about that about uh, eight months ago. Uh, a special TV program came on, and it was talking about philosophy. Yes. Right. Cloning. Right. It was talking about how they reproduce the split image of the individual. Well, see? Now, here's a man talking about cloning. If you got a giant over here, you just take a cell from him, and you can reproduce him in totality? Well, now, if the white man can do that on such cheap level, then the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, we as a people represent God. We are the God family. Then the very nature that is in the God is also in you. That's why we should always show respect to one another. See, this is why we never understood why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had us saying, sir, to one another. Sure, it had us showing respect to one another. Because when God meets God, they don't come there, hey, nigga, what's going on? <laughs> we just don't talk like that to one another, brother. I know when I look at you, even though you may be far off in your actions from being the God that you are born by nature to be, nevertheless, we must respect you, not for what you are in reality, but what, I'm sorry, what you are circumstantially, but for what you are in reality. And you are God. And James in the Bible says, and I close this point off with this, he says, how can you say you love God whom you have never seen and hate your brother whom you see every day? What is James saying? When you see your brother, boy, you're looking at God. And you've been running around here trying to find a mystery God, and the mystery God don't exist. Once more, I'd like to reiterate that Orthodox Muslims believe the Bible has been corrupted. Second, if we look at the line quoted here, supposedly in from James, we um, can't really directly come to that conclusion. The, the, the fly in the ointment here is that, granted, at the time that this particular thing was written or translated or whatever, the Trinity may have existed and all that other stuff, um, but Christians still believe in a supreme being according to themselves. So... That is a really big misquote. But it does remind me of something said in Islam, and that is that you have to thank people as well as Allah, and that you don't really, like, thanking people should be part of thanking Allah. It's us, under the wisdom and power of the supreme being that carries out the functions of the divine supreme being. We are gods. David the psalmist says, ye are all gods, children of the most high God. So I hope that now some of this is clear, some of it is clear, at least it starts to clear up. Then we're going to take a whole lecture on it and go into the attributes and the characteristics of God as found in the Quran and the Bible and show you that these are not attributes of spirits, these are the attributes and characteristics of the divine human being. Ooh, I see. Now I'm thinking maybe those aliens in Ezekiel's wheel aren't really aliens, they're just human beings who have reached another state of godliness, essentially. That's about as much as I can make of this. And again, we're severely deviating from Orthodox Islam on much of this. And of course, because we're getting to the conclusion, it's all being slammed together. And there are some riddles, as you can see, and inconsistencies. So let us tread on ever onward, friends. God is ever living. That's true. The nation, there's no end to us. We'll always be here. See how cells in the body die all the time, but the body continues? Every time you get in the bathtub, you see that ring around the tub? 
that's dead cells. But you lie, but the cells have died, but they gave birth to other cells. You straight. Well, that's the way it is with God. The body remains, and it keeps on producing one, you know, who will be the head of that nation. And that head is always the best Noah. And I, how can you tell that Master Farah Muhammad is the best Noah? He's revealing that which no man ever considered before. And when they try to fight it, the more they fight it, the more they say, man, he's right. See, now I tell you something. I had to go all the way to the east to find out that the real man was in the west. <laughs> A brother called me from Denver today, Colorado. He went to synagogue and he studied in a class under Dr. Cheik Antadiop, one of the most brilliant black um, uh, men on the scene today. And Dr. Cheik Antadiop is getting to, to the point where he's seeing that the black man is really the father of all men, but there's a, there's a point in his knowledge where he don't have the root of it, and here the root comes out of Georgia, out of a little humble black man named the Army Elijah Muhammad. And because we're so disrespectful of ourselves, we don't think that God is wise enough to take a black man from among us and make anything out of him. See, and when you see a man stand up and say, I am the messenger of God, and you say, oh, man, he's a nigger just like me. He ain't nothing. And then that man do a work like Elijah Muhammad did in our midst, and you still don't want to recognize him, it's because of your disrespect of yourself. So if God wanted to hide, the best place he could hide and never be detected is to just get into one of you and hide. you never find him. Here again we have a sort of riddle. If God wanted to hide, he would have hid in Fard Muhammad. Um, yeah, so much wrong with that. Just, I mean, it's a summation of all my other points, basically that man can't be God, and God hiding in someone, ugh, just, what are you talking about? Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes, sir. Now, we 
get back. Now, what was confusing me was, when I thought that okay, Adam represents the making of a man, Yakub made the right man, so it sounds like Yakub made us. Very good. Was that Yakub who was talking Oh, about come on, brother. Let's get into this thing. <laughs> <laughs> I had mentioned Yakub previously, and I'm surprised that we got to him in this lesson, but I'm glad we did because I can talk about him. The NOI basically believes that he is responsible for creating the so-called white race. The NOI's claim is that Yakub, also obviously his name is Jacob, but uh, Yakub is essentially an Arabic variant much like Yahya is a variant of Joshua. There's a story in Genesis that actually exists where Jacob alters the fur color of the goats and sheep in somebody's flock. I believe it was his uncle. But uh, the NOI says that also applied to changing skin color. And essentially... That's the backstory is that he was an evil scientist and he created the white race who would confound the black race, essentially. Oh, Brother Lamont, go ahead. Go ahead. Yaku is what was going to confuse me about Yaku. Okay, what was going to confuse me is who is this talking in Genesis 1 All right, let's go after it. Let's go after it. Looks like this is going to be our class tonight, like clearing up the questions. Oh, well, you know, yeah, well, you know, but we're going to get the program in position. It's going to be all right. Yeah. <laughs> Doing this is kind of like going down a rabbit hole for me because I've listened to mostly Farrakhan's sermons, I guess you could call them. I haven't really been privy to the classroom lesson aspect of this, and it's certainly interesting to listen to. And it does indeed clear a few ideas up in terms of their theology, but we still ultimately get a theology of riddles. It's working me a little hard. Now, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has said, if you look, brothers and sisters, in the genesis of the Bible, it starts off dealing with a creator. And this creator in words is just saying, be, and it is. And he's bringing into existence light and separating the firmament and the waters and so forth. I mean, very powerful. When it gets to the 26th chapter, it gets a little weak there. And he says, let us make man. I need a little help here. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said that that is not the God creator of the heavens and the earth talking in Genesis 1, 26. That is one of the family of the gods and his idea to make a man in Genesis 1, 26. That is one of the family of the gods and his idea to make a man. Now notice, and God said, we went over this once before, but we're going to do it again. And God said, let us make man. Now, man is a step down from God, isn't it? According to the book. All right, so he makes man, and this man is the image. Excuse me. I saw the board move. I knew there was a force in Paul. Yeah. <laughs> oh, brother. <laughs> All right, now, this man is the image and the likeness of God. 
Now, if he's the image and the likeness, he's yet not the essence of this. Because the essence of God is God, not his image. Now, hear me good. You make a child, any of you that have a son. That son is not your image. He's not your likeness. He's the same essence as you. That's right. So your son really is you. That's you going on. But this is not God going on. This is something different here. So the word is not using God created. It says God made. That's a key word. The verb here says something about the action. Aside from the basic Islamic argument that the Torah and the Bible and the Tanakh and all previous Abrahamic revelations have been corrupted by man, there is another problem here. Here, the biggest problem is we're not referring to the original Hebrew. We're only using the English translation that was selected as an example. And it's always best to go back to the original text and essentially see what's going on there. That's why when we talk about the Holy Quran, we take words in it, especially for people who aren't very good at Arabic like myself, we take words in it and we explain, okay, well, this prefix means this. Um, when you put it with this other word, it means this. And the meaning of the words is quite clear. But when you have an English translation, of course it's going to veer off because we're talking about different languages. And that happens with the Quran all the time. So there are ones that are literal, which I prefer. I prefer literal translation. And sometimes it's not the easiest to read, but to my mind it's the best because it can't be artistically moved around. And I have a feeling that's what happened with at least English versions of the Old Testament. So here we're looking at the wrong word. This is akin to, oh, I cannot remember her name, but the, the books that um, inspired Zeitgeist, this lady said, oh, well, you know, all of the ancient religions and even Christianity, it's a sun-worshipping religion. They just put son of God in the wrong spelling. It, instead of S-O-N, it's supposed to be S-U-N. And, and, you know, obviously that's a terrible argument because it would have been in Amharic or Hebrew, whatever document you're looking at, would not have been in modern English, which is why that's such a stupid interpretation. And that's the problem here is we're using a certain English translation, and do we know if it translates or not? I don't know. I'm not going to look into it more, but I encourage you to. Yes, sir. Now, when you make something, you take it from a created essence. That's right. Uh -huh. Come into it. Break it down, brother. Look. See this microphone? This is made. But the essence from which this is taken is created. It's raw material that you get out of the earth. But to make means to fashion out of a created essence. Now God is self-created. But when you make something, you take it from the created essence. And from means actually away from. You are taking it out of a created essence and you're fashioning something new called that. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says that this symbolically is talking about the making of the white race. Now, when he says God made man from the dust of the earth, you don't make man from dust. Dust don't have no quality of life in it. It's got to be the presence of water for there to be the presence of life. So the Holy Quran teaches all life comes from water. But then this is talking about dust. Now, what is dust? Come on. What is dust? 
If we look at dust, see this here? If we start shaving this, you get little pieces of this flying off in the atmosphere. It is something that exists. It is matter, but it's not doing anything because it's not a part of its original essence. Just dust, just out here doing nothing. But if you put water with dust, then you've got something that's got the ingredients to bring light. Oh, brother, now here we go. Everybody all right? You ain't going to sleep on me, are you? Oh, all right. Now, what is the dust here? The Honorable Elijah Muhammad in Message to the Black Man said that the dust represents the weaker germ in the black man. It's there dormant, doing nothing. That brown germ that he talked about, it's in you right now. But Yaku studied it and said, uh, if I can separate that brown germ from the black germ. Now look at this. Don't you know, brother and sister, that you couldn't get evil out of the black man unless evil was already in us? But the evil that's in us remains in check because the powerful positive germ in the seed keeps the weak one always under control. But Yaqub saw if he could separate the two, take that brown germ out from under its natural control, then graft it to its final stage, he could produce a people unalike that would attract the original man. And with a system of tricks and lies, this one could rule that one until the coming of God out of this one to put that one into destruction. This is your Bible from one end of it to another. It's talking about now uh, a, a made enemy in the garden. Now look, I'm going to go back after that again, but I, I want you to see this now. God made a man, and the man that he made was a rebel. Yeah. The man Adam rebelled. That's not a prophet. The Islamic people say Adam is a prophet. Islamic people are basically people of the religion of Islam. I think he means Muslims. But it's kind of telling that he says what he just said. Because to me, it in itself means that he knows he's not practicing Orthodox Islam. And there is no prophet that rebels against the will of God. See, so here you have a contradiction unless it's understood. Just bear with me a few minutes. It's going to be all right. Now, this Adam rebelled against God and had to be put out of the garden. Is that right? Okay. Now, 59,999 with Yaku made 60,000. And God said to who? To us. The us represented those that were his followers, Yaku's followers. Come on, let us make a man. I'm going to make a people to rule. Right. Yes, sir. Let us make a man in our image, yes, sir. He's not going to be our nature. He's going to be our image. He's going to look human, but he'll be a different kind of human being, and we'll call him mankind. Yes, sir. Not yes, sir. man, but a kind of a man. Yes, a different species of human being with a different total kind of nature, a very rebellious nature, yes, sir. fiery nature. Yes, Troublemaking nature, yes, mischief making nature yes, that will cause bloodshed on the earth. Yes, now, where is this 60,000 in scripture? Here is with Count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, 603 score. The beast number, 60 is three score. 
It took 60,000 people to stop in the making of the white man. That's right. It took 600 years to grasp him out. That's right. And he was given 6,000 years to rule. And the number six became <clears throat> the, uh, the number that Moses gave him to constantly remind him, look, boy, the seventh day is the Sabbath. You got six days to do your work. Raise hell all you want for six days, but the seventh, that is the Lord's day, you keep it holy. And so from the time of Moses, white people have been reminded to keep the Sabbath. So this is what you do coming up under a Christian world. You raise hell for six days. Tell the truth. You got so bad now, you raise hell every day. They ain't got no day for God. But when we were coming up, this was years ago, when I was a little boy, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Man, we didn't even bathe during the week. You wash up, but your bath was Saturday night. Mama put a big old pan in the floor, put the hot water in the pan. Come, Johnny. Come, Josie. Come, Lucy. Come, Sally. Take your bath. And we would jump in that big tub. The boys jump in once. The girls jump in wash themselves and get out and now you go to bed next morning your new clothes is all laid out on the bed why because we're going to church this morning why was that that was given to white people to remind them that after they had lived on our planet six thousand years raising hell that in the dawn of the seven thousand year god would come and when god come he would put them to rest and their six-day labor would be destroyed. Now when God comes, you have the Genesis all over again. Because as they had their Genesis, you got to have yours. So let's remember that in this context, when he's saying yours, that means so-called black peoples. And this particular part is very interesting to me, if I understand it correctly. Basically what Farrakhan is saying is basically the quote-unquote white people had an epoch, right? And then the quote-unquote black people will have an epoch. And this is incredibly Gnostic of them, um, the cyclical nature of things. And uh, it's been brought up in many theories from Nazism and theosophy, apparently, to the nation of Islam. And it makes sense here that this kind of renewal thing is mixed in with the races, the supposed races anyway, because it only helps them kind of strengthen their argument. That is, of course, if you believe their argument. It also feels like we've taken a really long time to get here. And even giving them the benefit of the doubt that, oh, well, you need to understand X before you understand Y, I mean, I get that, but, um, yeah, this is a little long-winded. Now, here it comes again. Here's where the prophet comes in. The Adam that is the prophet or the divine guy. Everybody all right? Doesn't the Bible tell you about two Adams? He said the first Adam was made from the dust of the earth. The second Adam is made of a quickening spirit. Why was that? That was given to white people to remind them that after they had lived on our planet 6,000 years raising hell, that in the dawn of the 7,000 year God would come. And when God come, he would put them to rest and their six day labor would be destroyed. Now when God comes, you have the Genesis all over again. Because as they had their Genesis, you got to have yours. Now here it comes again. Here's where the prophet comes in. The Adam that is the prophet or the divine guy. Everybody all right? Doesn't the Bible tell you about two Adams? He said the first Adam was made from the dust of the earth. The second Adam is made of a quickening spirit. Well, you are the original man. All you need is for your spirit to be quickened. That means give life to you. 
Well, here it is now. Didn't the sister ask me a question? I think it was in this class. She said that there was water, there was grass, but there was no man that would till the earth. Who, who raised that question in the class here? Was it in this class? It wasn't in this class? Was it in this class? That's what I thought. It was about uh, Adam, and it was about the making of man. And they were talking about, you know, there was grass, there was clouds, there was this, but there was no man to till the ground. Well, all that's talking about is, look, it couldn't, it couldn't be grass and there was no water. Wherever you see water or grass, you, there's got to be water. Wherever you see cattle, there's got to be water. Wherever you see any living thing, there's got to be water. But they said there was no man to till the ground. This is you it's talking about. You and I are like animals. There is nobody to cultivate. To till means to cultivate, to nurture, to nourish, to de develop, to evolve you from a low level to the stature of God. There was no man to make you into yourself. So God said, let us make man. But this time we're not making him in our image. We're quickening his spirit because he's already us. He is a God like we are. All he needs is to have his spirit quickened and he will stand up like a God. And in the honorable Elijah Muhammad's infancy, he mastered writing. He, I mean, I've sat with the honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, brother, the white man is like a little piece of string on my finger. Right. He said, I have to look at my finger sometime to see whether the string is there. I just don't feel it. Racism aside, you can kind of tell why the Nation of Islam essentially needs maybe not a reformation, but it just needs some new material because at this point, we're still talking about what Elijah Muhammad said in what, the 60s and the 50s? Um, and it's just not as applicable today. As I've said before, we have minorities in places of power. So what we're listening to is almost like going back in time. We're hearing this certain racial rhetoric from a standpoint of 30s and 20s. And back then it was about, we're going to be better than whatever race, right? And now we're a little bit more inclusive. Society is for lack of a better term, more progressive or uh, more accepting, more tolerable of different people. And that's going to be a problem uh, because I don't really see much of a future for the Nation of Islam if they can't tile this stuff into modern day. And thus far, he hasn't. He said, that's the way the white man is. And if you stick with me, I'll have you mastering him. Well, how could he have us mastering him unless he was the master of him? And I mean, I've seen white folks come to the messenger and just be bowing down to him, brother. If you had read some of the letters that he received from white people saying, yes, we bear witness, we are devils, is there any chance for us? I remember when I traveled around when Malcolm was the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's minister. The messenger told Malcolm whenever Malcolm preached, he said, dump fire on him. And whenever I was with Malcolm and Malcolm was preaching, he dumped pure fire on white folks. And I mean, white folks would be in the audience and Malcolm be talking about them and they would start <laughs> hissing him. He said, yeah, that's what the snake did in the garden, your father. <laughs> oh, man. I mean, look at they be burning, brother. And after Malcolm gets finished pouring fire on him, you see the little white girls and boys just crying and asking him, is there any hope? Is there anything we can do to escape what they know is coming? Malcolm said, ain't nothing you can do. That's gone and died, that's all. <laughs> the hell on off the planet. So, of course, this is basically the rule, but there are exceptions to the rule. There are people like... Khalid Muhammad, who were actually kicked out of the NOI because they were too racist. And, you know, I mean, listening to, to Minister Farrakhan, especially that last statement, you kind of think, how, how could, why? I mean, it must have been some internal politicky thing because Khalid Muhammad said basically the same thing 
that uh, Farrakhan just said. What's also very interesting is there is actually a split within the nation of Islam, and some believe that Farrakhan isn't the rightful successor. And that sounds familiar to Muslims, doesn't it? Well... So, brother, your studying has caused you to line it up good. Now, it's even deeper than that, but time just don't permit us tonight to just tap around on some of the roots. You know, but brothers and sisters, honest, that book, Message to the Black Man, once you've read it, don't think you know it. If you go back over it again, it'll reveal more to you. You go back over it another time, it'll reveal more to you. Now, I'm talking out of that book. I was, I've been a follower of Elijah Muhammad for 25 years, and I'm a baby. I'm still a baby in the knowledge, as God is my judge. And I don't consider myself wise. I'm still a student of the wisdom. And I say this to you very humbly, brother and sister. If you will study this little black man from Georgia, study what God has revealed to him for your salvation, you will become a mighty woman and a mighty man. And all we're asking you to do is study, investigate, and go out and try the knowledge out. When you think you've got a handle on it, try it out. And brother, you just take a few little sayings out of this book and drop it in a crowd. that will be like dropping off an atom bomb in there, brother. People say, what you say? What you say? To me, this is what's at the heart of the Nation of Islam is controversy sells. And I believe it's essentially done the same way as the Church of Satan, where it's all publicity and just completely different takes on normal things. So it's essentially the shock rock of religion. And that, of course, is evidenced in the nation of Islam's history and the extremism that is within their ranks, that is within their theology. Eyes get big, brother. Look like they're looking at flying saucers. This knowledge will stop them in their tracks. And I'm telling you, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, as we conclude this portion, we're going we're gonna to get into programming position for about 20 minutes. As we conclude this portion, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said to me, this is just before he left, I didn't really understand it. As I always say, I didn't understand it because, you know, I thought I really understood. You know, and as I look back on myself, I was really an arrogant fella. Uh, you know, because you could stand up and you could answer a lot of people's questions. You really got to thinking, you know, you was hot stuff. And the test showed me that I didn't know what I thought I knew. And I had to take a review and become a child all over again. And I love it. I don't think I'll ever grow up again. I'm going to stay a child under Muhammad. Now, I say that to say this, that yeah, I forgot the point. Now, I wanted to, to close this uh, session out and that section out. Oh, yes. The messenger said to me, he said, uh, brother, he said, uh, I'm going to go away. Now, listen to his words, Captain. He said, I'll be gone approximately three years. <coughs> now, don't you change the teachings while I'm gone. Now, those are orders. Don't you change the teachings while I'm gone. So now we're definitely getting into Islamic and Jewish territory here, where Farrakhan, to those not in the know, as I mentioned before, Farrakhan is essentially trying to sell the mainstream NOI as the proper NOI. There are other smaller offshoots of the Nation of Islam, and they call themselves 
a variation of the nation of Islam. They believe that Fard Muhammad came in the person, or that Allah came in the person of Fard Muhammad, blah, blah, blah. But they do not believe that Louis Farrakhan is the proper successor. So here, this is kind of an argument against that. And he's trying to prove that, no, what I'm teaching is the real, actual nation of Islam dogma theology. He said, I'm going away to study. He didn't say he was going to die. He said, I'm going away to study. He said, what I've given you is just a wake-up message. He said, if you are faithful, when I return, I will reveal the new teaching through you. That's conditional, if you are faithful. All right. February 1975, the announced death of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Everything that he taught me about this hour, I couldn't make heads nor tails of it because if he's dead, it don't add up. Something's missing somewhere. I couldn't figure it out. And I got thrown in the confusion. But now that by his grace I've come back to myself, I understand a little better why he said don't change the teaching. Now I'm going around this country with his teaching, not changing it. And what you don't realize, I'm talking about these old Muslims, you don't realize that God has produced a virgin people right in your face. What? A virgin? What you talking about, man? You are like little virgins. Because even though Muhammad spent a Lifetime in your midst. Many of you don't even know that he ever was here. <clears throat> and the white man has been so thorough in his evil machinations, he has robbed you of the history of your recent struggle so that this generation that's out there now don't even know that a struggle ever went on. You talk about Dr. Martin Luther King, they say, oh yeah, that's the man's dreams. <laughs> yeah, I heard of Dr. King, that's, that's a dream. <laughs> you ask them, who is Malcolm X? Is he one of the uh, Beatles? <laughs> you wouldn't believe that you could go to students and ask them about Malcolm and they wouldn't know who he is. To be fair... The American populace is dumb anyway. I'm sure there are plenty of even college kids who don't know which side won the Civil War and stuff. So we're kind of making a mountain out of a molehill here. I think that most so-called black people would know who Malcolm X was. I mean, he was a pretty central character to civil rights. So you wouldn't believe that they don't know nothing about H. Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael. Huey Newton, Eldridge Cleaver, uh, Ron Karenga. They don't know nothing about the men, Imam Baraka, that helped to shape the 60s. They don't know nothing about these men. Why don't they know? Because white folks, while they kept our fathers busy voting, busy going into white folks' restaurants, nightclubs, hotels, and sweethearting with white women, and vice versa, He robbed a whole nation of the history of struggle producing a virgin people. Oh, they look wild and crazy, but they're virgin. They don't even know the mistakes of yesterday. That's really something. Because that's been wiped out of their knowledge. So the messenger said, don't you change the teaching. Then just before... My daughters got married into the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's family. He sat on the bed in his room with me this day, October 1974. And he was remarking about his feelings about my children. 
And then he said, you know, brethren, when my name is mentioned, and listen to this, the people are going to say, oh, that man, I remember him. His teaching was good for that time, but it's not good for this time. And he said it very And sure enough, if you listen to his former followers, they say his teaching was all right then, but it ain't no good for now. But he told me, don't change the teaching, brother. Now you watch. By God's help, a whole nation is going to come up. You're going to see this. If you live just a few more days, you're going to see this. And they're going to come up to the very word that the hypocritical followers of the army, Elijah Muhammad, have abandoned. And you're going to see people walking right by you coming to the man you just left. And they'll say, man, where the hell are you going? Weren't you trying to get me into this at one time? So what I've learned today, aside from the things that were in this lesson about the Nation of Islam, is that I really need to listen to more of these lessons because... It did clear up a few things. It did go into more detail with a few things, and that's great. But we haven't really answered the fundamental question, at least to the Islamic mind, as to how can man be God? And the question only has the answer, a man cannot be God. It cannot be possible. Because in the Quran, it says, Basically meaning that there is only one God. He cannot beget, nor is he begotten. And there's nothing that stands in comparison to God. So our earthly experiences, including knowing other human beings, is indeed a comparison to known things, right? So if we can't compare God to known things, you can't pin that he was a man at this certain time and whatnot. And we can also see here essentially a merging of a few different things. With the aliens part, we have the Eric Von Daniken crazy 70s, um, ancient astronauts theories, and then we also have Christianity with man is God mixed in with Islam. As per usual, didn't really get any kind of an answer in solid terms. Uh, when you read things about Islam, you get a pretty solid answer. There may be varying ideas, but um, yeah, when it comes to Taweed, there really aren't very many varying ideas. The closest to variance that it gets is maybe some Sunni may see the Shia using shrines or something or saints as associating partners with God. That's about as far as it goes. So thanks for watching. I hope this cleared up some things about the Nation of Islam for you. And I hope it also cleared up why we Orthodox Muslims, or at least this Orthodox Muslim, does not consider these guys actual Muslims.